My talk is closing group of uh, cyber physical systems, and uh, the main part of the talk will be dedicated to the design of, of, of medical devices and systems. And uh, the, the work that we've been doing has been motivated by the fact that information technology has penetrated different domains of, of, uh, of medical devices and systems. And we have new ways that we design medical robots, new ways that we design implantable, uh, implantable devices, or the new ways how we design these interoperable systems where several medical devices need to, to communicate over the network. So we are all aware of, of, of the new opportunities in, in the medical domain, but if you even look from the industrial and from the um, uh, certification point of view, from the FDA's point of view, you can see that there is a, a steady rise of the number of uh, pre-approved uh, devices, even in the, in the class three, uh, medical devices that are safety critical and where any failure can actually uh, lead to the uh, very high risk of, of, of injury. So from one side, we have a lot of really good feel-good stories. But we also have a completely different perspective. And pretty much every few months you have a new article talking about new issues that have happened with medical uh, devices, some medical devices. Recall how uh, certain <coughs> devices have, uh, have injured the patients. And I would even argue that although some of them are, are um, some of them are very scary, most of them also go unreported. In our interaction with, uh, with surgeons that are very thrilled with using surgical robots, they actually never assume that surgical robots might mess things up. If something goes wrong, it's usually a uh, fellow's fault, or it's, 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 it's resident's fault, or certain fault in general. So they don't think about these kind of things, and, and, and a lot of these issues actually go unnoticed. Some of them don't go unnoticed, as in, as in this particular case, where a very simple error, error in software, has caused that a very small operation, where, where a small part of, of tissue was supposed to be removed from the throat, uh, ended up in, in, in very serious injuries for, for, for the patient. In this particular case, what you have is that you have that uh, the, the, the oxygen, should, uh, the oxygen uh, should be turned off when the laser is, is operating, and actually there was a small glitch, and the surgeon didn't pay extra attention to that, and actually the, the, the laser uh, uh, triggered the, the flame and uh, severely hurt the patient. So, from the distributed, uh, from the distributed systems point of view, we really know how to design these systems. But on the other thing, on the other hand, a lot of things like this happen and they, they occur, uh, they keep on happening. If you look at the actual number that we have here in, in, in 2011, 24% of all medical device recalls were caused by software. And you and you would assume that, that is a, uh, that is quite a large so this is a relative number, but if you look at those numbers, you can see that more than 1.5 million of devices were recalled in nine-year period at the beginning of this century. So these are staggering numbers, really, really staggering numbers. And I would like to highlight a, a significant difference between your implantable medical device being recalled and your uh, Volkswagen being recalled. With, with, um, for example, if you look at implantable medical devices like like pacemakers, the less well-related is the last 10 years of 20th century, more than half a million of these devices were recalled. Mm -hmm. And the question is, why is this happening? We've been designing pacemakers for the last 50, 60 years. Should we already be able to do this job very well so that we don't have issues of this sort? Well, the problem is that we want these devices to be better. We want these devices to prolong patient's life. <laughs> As a result, they implement new functionalities, new ways of controlling the heart rate in a way that can ensure that the, the, the patient can live not 10 or 20 years, but 40 or even more on a very, very, uh, living a very normal lifestyle. So, as a result, you have all these new algorithms that are implemented on top of it, and that increases complexity of the software that you are designing on these systems. As a result, you have increased number of of potential safety violations. Okay, but as I said, this is not, I mean, you see this also in your automotive systems, you see this in your, in your, in your Volkswagen Vela, but again, you're not driving your car to your dealer, 
if you have implantable medical device, you actually have to go under surgery where they will take out your device. And we are talking about seriously, um, uh, seriously uh, sick patients, and you don't want to push them to put them through this extra, extra, extra burden. So, what's the problem? The problem is that what we actually have is that in these kind of medical devices, you actually have a soft software design for systems that closely interact with physical processes, systems that control some aspect of physical process, and also they control these physical processes that are very messy, very hard to to uh, very hard to to model. When you couple that with the standard way how software is developed for these medical devices, in a way that you really want to push them as fast as possible to the market, and you also don't provide consistency between the requirements and what the device should provide, you end up with a situation situation uh, uh, like that. I would like to highlight that although this is very specific, this is these are problems that you see in, in medical domain, these are also problems that you see in a wide range of other domains, where you talk about transportation, industrial automation, or, or, um, or, or smart cities and smart grids. What you have is you have increasingly complex systems that are being controlled by software that needs to process information at real time, and it needs to control some aspect of, the, of its environment to guarantee that certain certain things will be will be satisfied. Okay, so this is standard for all cyber physical systems. And although until now you had different areas that would pop up, you would have smart grids or industrial automation, there's something that's called science of cyber physical systems that tries to provide answers in a way how can we systematically build these systems? How can we systematically build control algorithms, how can we systematically synthesize code from them in a way that they guarantee that when you actually end up with the final design that it does what it's supposed to be doing. And it does it in a way that you can bet your life on it. Because we are more and more betting our lives on, on these kind of uh, on these kind of systems. So today I'll talk about most of the work that we've been doing in the in the medical device domain. Before I switch to some of the, the, the more recent work supported by, the, by DIPA and Intel, that is work on, on, on how can you, when you're not only worrying about faults, how can you also provide some kind of security guarantees for these kind of systems when you are performing control in real time. So, to start, we start with two simple, uh, two, two case studies that were leading our, our work because there is no one solution fits all you actually have to adapt your, your design methodology to a particular problem that you're considering. And we start with implantable, with implantable medical devices. The problem that we try to address in this domain, but we are trying to address it in, in every domain that, that is the focus of, of, of my lab, is how can we design software and systems for these kind of uh, life critical systems. And we are very, very, very strong believers in this uh, uh, development methodology called model-driven development, where you are trying to capture a model with as much uncertainty as, as you can as you can have, and then try to reason about properties of the system before you actually build the system. And you want to guarantee that while you're building the system, everything that you've proven on the modeling level is actually satisfied. You don't want to spend extra 90% of your efforts, of your time, of your money retesting and missing some of the very important uh, bugs. So let's switch to the to the model driven development for implantable pacemakers. And since there are a lot of people from from BME here, uh, I do apologize if most of you have already well aware of this. But implantable pacemakers, this is something I didn't have a clue when I started my 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 PhD. I'm double E major, so pretty much the the, the, the behavior of human heart was completely unknown for me. So. Pacemakers, standard thing, have two leads. These leads are placed in atrium and electrical, and their basic idea is they should provide electrical stimuli to the heart where intrinsic electrical activity is low. As simple as that. They are in the heart, so they are very safety critical. If they don't work, patient might not. If they malfunction, patient might not. So, there are plenty of different functionalities, and I will not cover all of them here, not even the, the ones that that we've implemented. I'll just focus to illustrate our design methodology on, on very basic, basic functionalities that, we, uh, that we've considered in our work. And this is 
um, standard, uh, uh, standard algorithms that are used to provide synchrony between, between activity in the atrium and activity in the ventricle. So if you look at standard DVD pacemaker mode that is exactly doing that, you have two pacemaker leads placed in atrium and ventricle, and their idea is to both use, be used as sensing uh, devices and to provide electrical signal. When they use the sensing, they should capture every kind of intrinsic electrical activity in the heart that is above certain threshold. Okay, so that is their first requirement they need to do. <coughs> then, both in the atrium and in the ventricle, and that's what we call atrial and ventricular sense. On the other hand, if there is no intrinsic electrical activity in the atrium and you want to provide this kind of synchronization between uh, uh, activity in, in, in these two chambers, after a certain amount of time, uh, that is what you want to do is you, the device needs to provide electrical pulse in the atrium. After again a certain amount of time passes, if there is no intrinsic activity, the device should again uh, uh, <coughs> provide pulse to the to the ventricle, and then the the, the heart muscle will compress it and push uh, sorry and push the, the blood out. So this is the basic thing from perspective of of of, of sensing and activation <coughs> the device needs to support. On the other hand, if you look at these kind of requirements, oh, you need to provide synchronization between two activities, you might end up with situation that where if you have electrical activity in the atrium, after a certain amount of time, you will pulse in the ventricle, but that will actually be too fast for the for the uh, the, 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 the therapy requirements. So what you will do is you will actually postpone this pace. And the basic idea here is that what you end up having in this upper rate limit. It's a bound, you cannot fa pace faster than this in the, in, the, in the ventricle. And finally, since you have two probes and these probes are antennas, what you need to ensure is that they are not picking up a lot of noise and register it as electrical activities. <coughs> so what you have is, in a, in a basic algorithm that they have, is they have this kind of uh, additional filtering periods after electrical registered or stimuli electrical activity. In that period, you don't sense anything. So these are what is called uh, the, the filters for, uh, that, that ensure that as a result, any kind of electrical activity in these filters will not be, will not be So this is the basic thing. We have implemented a lot, a lot um, of other uh, uh, control algorithms, some of the related to adaptive pacing that are using extra sensors to create context of a patient to provide more energy efficient um, a stimuli, but for the high-level description of our design, this is this is more. Difficult. So, how do we design these systems from this point on? So, usually, what you would have is you will have a biomedical engineer or you would have a, a physicians providing a set of guidance or high-level description of the algorithm to embedded uh, system designers, and the many system designers would usually have that code in a very, very uh, chaotic way, and they would provide a device. And there'll be a lot of testing, and hopefully FDA would <coughs> approve the particular device. Testing is currently the most common <coughs> and, and, and pretty much the only way how people analyze safety of these devices. In this particular case, what they do is they will say, okay, there are a set of pre-recorded scenarios, we push those scenarios through our device, and we say, do they satisfy the properties that we want or not? And it will be awesome if the world is ideal. You would have exactly things appearing at the output at points of time where you would expect them. But things are never ideal, so what you will end up having is you will end up having small jitters. And then you will say, okay, if it's close enough, this is still good. The problem with this kind of open loop testing is something that we've seen in the control a lot. If you don't have very robust control algorithm, you will end up with a system that this system provides stimuli to the plant. The moment it provides stimuli to the plant that is different than the stimuli that was used to generate these open loop clinical scenarios, your test cases are not clinically relevant anymore. So what you're testing is not valid anymore. What you would need to do is to see how effects of your pacemaker, how, how actions of your pacemaker affect the behavior of the, of the system. If we were able to show that in cases like pacemaker medicated tachycardia, you actually can pass open loop testing, but you will end up pushing a healthy heart 
into, into very hard tracing rate. <coughs> okay. So, our goal is to do what people have been doing in controls for quite a while, and this is to reason about the performance and safety of these devices in the closed loop environment. So, our idea would be, okay, let's move from this to something like this. Okay. So, if you're expecting that we have healthy, if that we have human hearts living in our, in our lab, we are not that cool. <laughs> um, we might be, like, in five years, uh, looking at some, some uh, latest research, but what we have, we would like to have this, we cannot have this. If you have this in your lab, we would like to test, so please don't hack me. Um, so, what we would like is, instead of having this kind of setup, we would like to use a model of the heart, and the model of the heart that should be relevant to the algorithms that we are, that we are uh, considering. The problem here is this kind of modeling challenge that is very present in medical, uh, medical devices, but also you can see it in other domains. The problem is that you have very heterogeneous system. You have discrete software, you have, uh, you have very continuous and messy behavior of the, of the heart. And if you try to model the heart in a very high fidelity, with a very high fidelity model, you might end up with something that is very realistic, but very useless for analysis of the, of, the, of the software behavior in this kind of system. So what you want to do is you want to provide uh, the right level of abstraction that will allow us to verify this model, that will allow us to use it then for testing, for simulation, and then finally for testing. And what we would like to do is we would like to go through these phases without the need to recheck for some properties that we've shown at, at, at a particular level. Okay, if we show something with verification and then we add extra features to our, to our, uh, to our model, we, would, we don't want to then test those properties that we have verified at all is called. When we say verify, in, in, in computer science, what we think is that we have formal mathematical proofs that those properties will always hold. Okay, so in the pacemaker design, what we noticed is that since uh, you, in these particular algorithms, you are only interested in timing. So then you can model these systems as time automata, and you can think of them as, as final state machines that can also somehow measure time and keep, pro and keep deciding whether to transition from one state to another also as a function of time and not only variables that are present in the, in the code. So since these kind of algorithms are only interested in timing, it turns out that from the software perspective, you can model software and your uh, hardware as time with the time automata model. We also shown that you can, starting from a, a, from a higher fidelity models of the heart, you can extract time automata model abstractions uh, of the heart behavior, and then all of a sudden you can verify certain properties. Some properties you cannot verify, but you would like to test them. Uh, for example, what's going on if if if, um, if the probe detaches from the actual bore and goes closer to the, to the ventricle. This is a, a problem that, that different kinds of algorithms are trying to solve. You cannot easily verify some of the properties, especially related to efficiency in these kind of algorithms. So what you would like is you would like to test these kind of things. So in order to do that, you want to use a model that will allow you to perform tests with a very high fidelity description of the behavior of the code, unlock front end and, the, and, uh, and the, uh, the heart itself. So for that, we use Simulink and Stable. And finally, when we uh, have performed verification and testing, we would like not to say, okay, we are done, let's ship it to embedded guys and these guys should do something with it. Pretty much start from scratch. What we would like is to automatically synthesize code in a way that you can put it on an off-the-shelf device and it works. Without the need to recheck and redo all of these, all of these things from scratch. <coughs> okay, so we were able to do that, but what I would like to highlight here is that you need to use different tools. And that is not only a medical device domain, that is pretty much in any CPS domain. There is no one silver bullet that will solve everything, okay? What you have to do is you have to use different tools and then you have to have this kind of very formal transitions from one tool to another that ensure that properties that were proven at one level 
were proven, were maintained when you move from one level of semantics to the other one. So in this particular case, we noticed that we need to design a, a, a tool to that will allow us to transform these timed automata models into simulink and state flow uh, compatible uh, semantics in order to ensure that properties that were proved, <coughs> proven here are satisfied here. And finally, then we rely on simulink coder to synthesize code that ensures that all those properties are satisfied here. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, I'm going to go into 10 minutes of, of, of um, overview of, of pretty much all of our work in, in this domain. So when we looked at at, these are some of the things from, from cardiac electrophysiology. Uh, from the perspective of, of, the, of the pacemaker, the thing that you're interested in is electrical conduction system of the heart. Okay, and when you analyze electrical conduction system of the heart, what people are doing is they're providing electrical stimuli to the tissue, and then they uh, look at how the, 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 the action potential changes over time. And there are very, very nice, very complex models that describe how, first of all, when you stimulate, uh, 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 tissue there, how will this uh, 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 electrical activity occur, that's one thing. And the other thing is how it moves from one set of cells, how it propagates uh, via the electrical conduction system of the heart. Okay, so we used some of these models that were available there and we provided an abstraction of them that says, okay, we have a node that specifies how uh, uh, some group of cells or, or tissue in some parts of the heart behave. And we have this path, model of the path, this is specifying how the electrical activity propagates from one tissue, one, one part of the heart to another part of the heart. And that all of, allow, all of a sudden would allow us to capture behavior of the, of the heart. The good thing is that from the pacemaker's perspective, this is not fully satisfied for defibrillators, but from the pacemaker's perspective, the heart behaves like the most important real-time system. And you have that the conduction is fully governed by the timing properties of the, uh, between, uh, uh, sorry, timing properties uh, in, the, in, the, in the heart tissue. So that allows us to design what we call this virtual heart model that <coughs> mimics the behavior of uh, of uh, electrical uh, conduction system of the heart as a group of node automata and path automata describing behavior of electrical stimuli and electrical propagation. And then the question is, what can we do with it? And then the other question is, how many of these nodes and how many of these paths do we need to put there? And the answer will depend on what do we want to use this model for. So. If we, for example, have one level of, 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 of details for this model, we can look from two separate perspectives. One is if we look at the pacemaker, and if we just look at timing and we have fixed probes, pretty much what you have is you have a very, you have unobservable system where you can only observe status, uh, state, um, I'm sorry, you can only uh, observe two states. So from that perspective, it makes sense that you can over approximate behavior of heart with this model. On the other hand, you can build a high fidelity model that will try to put a lot of these nodes, and this one is awesome. You can then reason about a lot of different properties. The problem with this one is that you need GPGPU with 192 cores to model behavior of the heart, and you will use 24 hours to model five seconds of, of, the, of the heart behavior. Okay, so you cannot simulate these models. Maybe in five years you will be able to simulate, but we are still not even close to verifying these models. So then the question is, what is the light level of abstraction that will allow us to have this trade-off between coverage and, and expressiveness that will allow us then to, to reason about properties of the of the group? <clears throat> but one thing that especially students that like to publish for, uh, forget very often is that when you build the model, it's not enough for you to say, this is awesome model, I really believe it's the best model ever and maybe even your advisor to say that, you actually have to provide some proof that this model is good enough and you need to <coughs> validate that particular model. And in this particular case, we used, uh, we were using a lot of guidance from, from, um, uh, from um, uh, clinicians at, at University of Pennsylvania Health System that were providing us with standard methods they used to actually evaluate 
uh, uh, models of, of, of human physiology. And we were able to show for a lot of different heart conditions how you can obtain them by modifying parameters of the model that we have. And there is actually a work now on, on how can you have patient-specific model starting from the from this general uh, uh, model that, that, that we've created. But from the perspective of, of how can we generate code for these for these systems, I'll just guide uh, um, guide you through the through this process. And for all of you who are not uh, EC or CS, um, maybe next five minutes will be. Will be a bit more math than than than, um, uh, than, uh, than needed. So, timed automata. Timed automata are, as I said, you can think of them as a finite state machine. Finite state machine with time, and that allows you to be to mimic <coughs> behavior of of a single node. You also have network of timed automata that allows you to model uh, two automata that potentially can communicate uh, uh, among each other. <coughs> Good thing about this one is that there is a very nicely defined semantics for time automata. Bad thing is that is very non-deterministic and <coughs> I'm sorry and as a result we sometimes have issues mapping time automata into software and hardware. <coughs> so we were able to show how you can build this kind of Standard DDD based pacemaker into this using this high, uh, um, uh, sorry, into this kind of uh, 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 time automata using this time automata formalism where we have a model of the heart, model of the pacemaker, and a set of monitors that we use that allow us to capture properties that we want to verify. And after that, how do we perform verification? Where, for example, we say that depending on the heart condition that we consider, if we, for example, consider a heart condition with heart block, or if we look at the most general behavior of the heart where you have fully asynchronous behavior of, of, uh, between two nodes, then you can use this heart model and then you can verify some properties like that you will not have pacing with a rate that is higher than the upper rate length. But you cannot verify some other properties using this very, very crude model of the heart. The next interaction is you provide some kind of uh, uh, description, some kind of relation between, between behavior in the, in the atrium and in ventricle by using path automata. And then that allows us to look at other properties and to actually formally verify that those properties are satisfied. What is not so cool in this kind of research is that the output, you do something, you wait for it for a while, and then the tool says, yes. And you can think how exciting our demos are. Um, so pretty much you say yes or no, or in the worst case, nothing happens, or 10 days. OK, so when we verify property like this, we then looked at, OK, depending on different types of properties, we needed to use different kind, different a uh, uh, level of fidelity in describing the heart behavior, and that is how we increase complexity of the heart model. Good thing is we can specify more things. Bad thing is as the uh, complexity increases, the things that we can do from the verification point of view become more and more limited. So what does that mean? Well, you will not be able to prove a lot of things. However, we were able to show that for all the properties that we were interested in, by using different kind of, 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 of um, modeling abstractions, we were able to, to obtain, the, uh, to, obtain uh, to prove that our model of the, what the pacemaker should do satisfies the desired requirements. So then the next question is, okay, you're in this level and you want to push here. How can you do that? Well, now things get really messy. This is open source tool where you know clearly defined semantics. This is something that you pay for, or not, but the thing is, this one has very messy semantics, or in this case, it's not even defined. What you know is you have some kind of description of this form that you have, for example, state for charts that can run in parallel, but unlike time automata that have non-deterministic execution, here you know that always this one will be evaluated before this one, before that one, etc. So you have execution that deterministically runs on a single thread and that has different 
semantic specified in English that captures how the how uh, uh, the execution of of any particular stateful chart will evolve over time. So, what we would like to do, and what is some of the thing that, that people are, are doing in, in computer engineering, computer science, is that okay, we would like to look at is there a relationship between a model in time automata and a model that we can push into into simulink and state flow. How can we do that? Well, we need to relate semantics in for time automata models and semantics of simulink and state flow model. And ideally, what we would like to do is we would create <coughs> transition system semantic for OPA, which we know, and then transition system semantics for, for uh, MATLAB, which we don't know. But if, if we were able to know it, then we can reason about, okay, what's the relationship between these two uh, uh, transition systems, whether one simulates the other, and that will allow us to then show that some relationship between, between these two models. The problem here is that you don't know what is going on with simulink. You don't know what is the exact semantics there. So by restricting on a specific set of features that are used here, we were able to cleanly define semantics of stateful blocks. And then what we were able to do is the following thing. We show that by restricting on a very large class of OPAL models, a subclass, we can actually show that that subclass will simulate, sorry, that simulating blocks simulate behavior of that subclass, which would mean that if we go back to here is that every reachable set of simulating uh, chart is all corresponds to a reachable state of the UPAL uh, time automata model of the pacemaker and, uh, and, the, and the device. What does that mean? Well, if UPAL model is safe, so if you, the interaction specified in UPAL between the device and, uh, and, uh, and the heart is safe, the interaction with the model in Simulink will be safe. Okay, and then we were able to provide a tool that will uh, formally uh, push models from UPAL into, into Simulink, and then puff. Five minutes after having a model in, in UPAL, you get the model in, in, uh, in, in state form. You can easily even choose in the, in the tool whether you want to decouple controller from the, from the environment, in this particular case, pacemaker from the cart. <coughs> Two minutes later, we were running it on uh, off-the-shelf Texas Instruments board. Ten minutes from the model to the code. And we were able then to use all of the standard uh, open-loop testing things to show that properties are satisfied. We also used our heart model in Simulink and synthesized something that we called heart in a box by using VHDL uh, uh, support uh, of Simulink, we were able to obtain hardware description of this model, and now we have a model of the heart. So we can use even this for open loop testing of third party devices. And we actually have, uh, uh, have used a setup where we, we uh, were using some of the, the pacemakers that people didn't need anymore. We connected them to our heart model, and then we were able to show them how by some of the issues that, that might occur. <coughs> So, who can use this framework and why were we doing this? Well, first of all, we were initially, our initial work was, was uh, inspired by our interaction with FDA because what they have is they notice that there is this problem that people are building these systems and they have harder and harder time to certify it. Okay, and they're building it in a way that, that by adding new features, they somehow try to claim that whatever has been added and does not affect things that are already there. So that was one, uh, one thing that was our initial, uh, initial motivation. Our goal was, can we design the systems in a way that will provide proofs that you can give to, to, to government agencies that, that can simplify the certification process, reduce the testing time it, uh, that, you'll, uh, that you'll need, and maybe even uh, a clinical trials. <coughs> On the other hand, device manufacturers really like this, oh, from 10 minutes, to the, uh, uh, sorry, from the model to code in 10 minutes. Everything you change, you change on the modeling level, you don't need to recode. Again, you synthesize, you get the code, you run it, and it works. 
And what we finally didn't anticipate is that people like these kind of uh, models that they it around because they can be used as a, as a, as a way to teach uh, students um, um, issues in, in cardiology. Another problem, so until the rest of the talk, I'll just give very high level uh, uh, things that we've, we've considered in, uh, in, 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 uh, in the lab. Another, is that a question? Uh, another another, another um, setup that we considered in this medical domain was, okay, this was a single implantable device. What happens if we go on the other side of the spectrum where we have a large number of interoperable devices that are used that, to coordinate among each other in a way that you, you can provide better, better care to the patients? And, and, um, and the problem that we looked at was, was um, um, autonomous uh, drug delivery to the patients where what we wanted to do is we wanted to avoid a lot of um, uh, a lot of uh, things that have happened in the past few years where these kind of uh, these kind of pumps that have been out there for a while were hurting people by providing more drugs than it was supposed to be than it was supposed to uh, that they were supposed to deliver you can prevent that if you look at this problem from the perspective of if you have better sensing you will be able, maybe not to have the optimal control, but you will be able to provide some safety guarantees. The problem is that these devices don't communicate among each other. And if you've ever entered a um, uh, surgical room or if you ever enter any kind of uh, a clinic, you will see that although they can communicate, come on, we have printers and phones communicating among each other, we don't have medical devices communicating. If you make them communicate in a suitable way, then you can close the loop over the network in a way that can guarantee that uh, the, the pump will not, will not uh, um, uh, hurt the patient. And what we had in this particular uh, case, we've shown how you can use some techniques from, uh, from uh, a robust control of nonlinear systems to guide modeling and guide software generation that will ensure that you will get information in time, or you will change the algorithm how you're providing a uh, drug to the patient, such that the patient is never pushed into, into unsafe, uh, unsafe zone. Okay, some of the work that, that we are currently considering in the lab is, is trying to address these problems in, in, this, uh, in, in the medical um, uh, device and system domain. But the name, the problem that we always face with is, is what is a good model of the system that we consider. And again, sometimes high fidelity models, although they look pretty, they are not useful to us. We sometimes need abstractions that can help us derive more efficient control algorithm or reason about safety or performance of these systems. So depending on, again, there is no silver bullet, depending on what you want to achieve, you will have to you will have to um, look at different kinds of, of, of uh, modeling techniques. Another thing that I think is very important is how can you reason about safety and, and performance in dynamically created scenarios. And some of these are, are things that people are not thinking initially when they're designing these systems. So for example, with pacemakers, one way to adapt, to have adaptive pacing is to use accelerometers that can create context of the patient, and then if the patient is running, the, it will pace faster. There are problems with that. If the patient is on a bike, and the upper part of his or her body is not moving, the, the device will not figure out what's going on. If they are driving on a bus in my home country, they'll be jumping all over the place, and then the device will think that they're running and will pace faster. Okay, and you're already scared, and then a lot of things. Okay. Then people say, okay, there are different ways of doing that. So, for example, there is mean trade ventilation that is providing electrical stimuli. So there is active sensing that is providing electrical stimuli, and it uses that to somehow estimate uh, the, the, the need of the body for oxygen. Awesome. Except, what happens if you have other sensor that is using active sensing? We now have more variables that people are using every day. But even let's go on a very more simpler problem. A patient was admitted in a hospital 
and they put a lot of different probes on him, they put EKG, they put EEG, some of those uh, were using active sensing and then all of a sudden pacemaker detected that the patient needs more oxygen, but that wasn't the reason. It was the, due to active sensing of other devices. As a result, it tried to pump faster. People, uh, the, the healthcare providers thought that the patient is entering cardiac arrest. They gave him extra drugs and then they figured out that they removed those probes and they thought that those drugs were effective. They were not effective. The reason was that you actually removed these extra devices that you had on the patient's body. So now when we are moving to maybe a situation down the line where you will have extra functionalities added on top of existing implantable devices, or you will have people with more than one implantable device, or you will have a lot of variables. There is a way, and there is, sorry, there is a need to capture what are the underlying assumptions that these algorithms are using. In that particular case, you need to somehow specify that there is uh, active sensing that is being used. And every time you add new device or new feature, check whether that device or that feature would violate some of the initial assumptions. We don't put new firmware, we don't new put new features on, 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 on Boeing plane while it's flying. We should start thinking about, okay, when we have these safety critical devices, how we are adding and how can we reason about safety in these dynamically created scenarios. Another thing is what's going on if you don't have reliable energy sources, if you use energy harvesting and all the other things, but I will not cover that that in this particular case. And one thing for students that I really think is very important, if you're doing this kind of interdisciplinary work, make sure that you are, be patient. You use completely different terms for, for the, the uh, vocabulary that you use and that people in other domains are using are completely different. A story that I like to repeat was we were talking about, okay, can you provide us with models of, of some, uh, some uh, part of, of, of human uh, physiology, these guys were saying, yeah, yeah, we have models, we were like, awesome, then we can put everything together and start reasoning about safety. Our models are mathematical models. Their models are live mice. Okay. So it takes some back and forth before we understand what they want and need and they understand what we can provide. Okay. But in the remaining... Uh, five to ten minutes. What I would like is just to to show you some other parts of the of the of the work that we've been doing, and mainly it will be on this high assurance design of of uh, secure, safety critical cyber physical systems or embedded control systems, whatever is closer to your heart. And this is something that has been motivated by by um, recent attacks attacks that appear every 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 few weeks. This is awesome. You have. Um, a kickoff meeting for your project and you are preparing these slides and the night before there is a, an article about how you can um, take over the vehicle on a, on a, while driving on, on highway and how you can push it off the road or how you can speed it up. So these kind of things are happening every day. It's very easy to show that you can hack anything that you want. However, from my perspective, I'm not looking at standard solutions for security of these systems. What I'm looking at, I'm looking at the fact that these kind of cyber physical systems or embedded control systems are using information obtained from sensors in real time, do some processing, and then try to apply appropriate actions for control. That means that in addition to standard cyber attacks, what you have is you have a set of extra attacks that can be used that to affect performance of control that you have in these systems. You can mess up with sensors, spoof GPS such that you have yacht going off course. Or what you can is you can also spoof GPS and with an out of service attack make the drone to think that it's in, in, uh, in Turkey while landing in, in Iran. Another thing that you can do is you can perform actuator attacks where you're providing extra stimuli that can mess up with the system. Or you can have standard communication attacks like in Stuxnet. Stuxnet was it was attack that, that affected Iranian nuclear pro, uh, uh, program by changing the data that was coming from the sensors. Just a simple replay attack, sending it back to the, the controller, 
control and figure out everything is going okay, while slowly speeding up centrifuge, and as a result, the whole system broke and it set the, the whole program 10 years. Um, uh, um, uh, it, it, it sent them like 10 years back. So one thing is, with these kind of things, you have extra set of features that you have to think about. The problem with security aware control design is that you have good thing and bad thing. Good thing is you have physical world that provides you with extra things that you have to worry about. You can spoof GPS. You can mess up with, with uh, 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 a later system. You can mess up with a lot of different sensors. ABS, easily to do. You just touch one thing and your ABS doesn't work the way it's supposed to. That's a bad thing. But there's always a good thing, or usually, or we hope that there's always a good thing. And in this particular case is physical systems obey physical laws. And you can use them to figure out whether something is going on the way that it should be going on. If my GPS tells me that I'm here and two seconds later at a time in, in, in DC, then it's probably either malfunctioning or corrupted. Okay, you can use some of these, uh, these things to, to reason about. about. So, the, our project is again focused on, you would say, what does this have to do with, with, with the things that you spoke about before? Well, again, we talk about embedded control systems, we talk about cyber physical systems, and we talk about how can we perform modeling of these systems and how can we design algorithms that are security aware that provide you with additional assurance of the of the performance of the system in this case. This is always the first part of, of the work that we are doing in the lab. Then after you generate those algorithms and you show that they can provide you with some extra levels of resiliency, what you want is you want to synthesize code and to run it on off-the-shelf hardware platforms and operating systems in a way that can guarantee that the properties that you've proven on algorithmic level are still satisfied. Okay, so we had one demo. In this particular example, what we were looking at was, this is a military, military vehicle that we had, and uh, what we have is this, we had cruise control. Cruise control usually uses odometry measurements to determine speed and to speed up or slow down if needed. What we had here is we said, okay, we will not use only, only uh, encoders, we will use GPS, we will use, this is uh, using electric motors, so we will use current consumption. We will build dynamical model of the system and then use that dynamical model to correlate some of these measurements. And what we end up having in this particular example What we end up having in this particular example, we show that even if you attack some of the sensors, when you are running our attack resilient estimation and attack resilient control, you are able to follow the speed within the predefined bounds. And those bounds are dependent on the guarantees that you can get from your network, from the operating system. We have actually formal proofs on this. If you switch and use standard Kalman filtering that most of these systems are using, you can easily show how you can slow down things and how you can make the robot think that it's going way faster start in, so that it actually stops. Switching back to our controller, you will see that the robot will start uh, continue tracking uh, this, uh, this, uh, the desired velocity. We move from standard, from uh, military robot to a real car. This is an American built car whose make and model we are not allowed to, to disclose. But what we had is we connected to OBT port, we get, got the data in, 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 uh, in, uh, in real time. We were, not, we were driving in Palo Alto. We were not allowed to control, but what we were doing is we were doing estimation and then uh, we were co uh, comparing estimation uh, results with the uh, ground truth by using encoders, by using GPS, by using other sensors that we can obtain from the OBD port. And we were able to show that even if you have spoof GPS, or even if you get access over our CAN bus, you can, we can still um, estimate the velocity in a, in a way that will allow us to perform uh, resilient control. So, things that we are working on now is how can we boost up some of these attack detection and identification algorithms. But always I, I'm trying to highlight, for example, one of the approaches that we are using is 
you have measurements that are provided by these continuous sensors that measure velocity or position or things of that sort. But you also have discrete event sensors that are measuring, oh, I see a building there with a camera. Or in the case of that drone, if that drone used the information from FM radio showing it's picking up a lot of Iranian FM uh, stations, it wouldn't figure out that it's landing near Ankara. Okay, so you can use these extra pieces of information and then our idea is how can we merge them in a way that will allow us to boost up resiliency claims for our cost. But that is only one part of the work that we are doing. Again, we always ask questions, can these awesome algorithms that we or someone else is developing, can we put them on hardware and can we put them on systems that don't cost $10,000, but something that is off-the-shelf operating system or somewhat off-the-shelf operating system, off-the-shelf hardware. How can we synthesize code that ensures that we are not messing up with some of these properties, that everything that is required on this level is satisfied on this level? And one of the recent research was on code generation for these kind of embedded control systems. You have high-level specifications of of, math, of of code, whether it's standard linear control or convex optimization. You get code using some code generator like CVX Gen or Simulincoder. You don't know what the generator is doing, but you still want to be able to reason about correctness of, of this. This is a very hard problem. A lot of times you integrate in system from different manufacturers, you don't know what exactly they are doing because that's their IP. The question is how can you provide proofs that cross these IP borders, what is the, high, the, the, the highest level of information that will still allow you to reason about correctness of these things and we build tools that allow us to, to show that this code, that the that generated code satisfies the desired properties, which then allows us to provide this formal guarantee over the whole, over the whole design flow. So, uh, don't worry, I'm done. Uh, the left, uh, I would just like to thank a lot of my collaborators and, uh, and, and some of the industrial and, and, and government uh, agencies. So if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to ask. research on, on, on heart modeling for this type of application has been out there for, for quite some time. So instead of looking at, at, at a lot of logs of, of data recording, we first hit the books. And the most, a lot of these things is actually captured, uh, captured there. What we've used, some of these recordings, is that to illustrate that those kind of behaviors are captured by the model that we have. Uh, a different problem is now when you have this model of the heart behavior, and that one behavior of that model is, is characterized by a lot of parameters. How can you create more patient-specific model from recording of, of a patient or certain groups of patients? That is a, a, a somewhat relevant but an area of research that we are we are thinking of diving into. So when you talk about these guarantees against, uh, you know, like attacks or something, the, uh, you know, putting this device in the car so it kind of knows and you can't trigger it, how do you think about providing guarantees for attacks that you haven't thought of, or kind of like unknown types of attacks? Is there a way of... Awesome, awesome question. Well, again, you have a model that will allow you, there are different levels of how you can model attacks, but the most general model for this kind of extra attack with extra signal injection is that you add additional term to your dynamics of your system. Okay, And then depending on whether it's attack over a network where all of the sensors can be attacked, then that term will be the corresponding to a vector that can have any values over any of the coordinates. Or if it's attack on the environment of particular sensors like GPS, then that is a sparse vector. 
it says, okay, you cannot attack IMU, so this attack vector has to have zero there, but you can attack GPS or ABS, so here and here you can have any value. That is a very, that's the most general model that you can use from this perspective. And then use some tricks from sparse sampling, how to provide guarantees if whatever the attacker pushes into the system, with some assumptions on how well do you know the, the, the physical model. Meaning, what is the error of your model? What is the noise, what are noise buttons, for example? And then, for example, in this particular case, you can push through the analysis from, uh, from uh, stability of, of um, L0 and L1 uh, uh, estimators into this kind of problem, and then you show that you have that you have guarantees on whatever the attacker pushes there. As long as some sensors are not corrupted, you can have uh, good control. Um, so you mentioned an example earlier of um, a situation where, like, the pacemaker may confuse the environment that the person is in, maybe they're on the bus, like you mentioned, where mm -hmm. things are moving. So, do you have any systems, or are you considering systems where you have, like, the person who actually is using the pacemaker interacts back to the system to either, like, uh, I guess, confirm or, or validate whether or not it's... Those are, that, that's an excellent question. There is something, so for example, in, in, in this kind of distributed medical systems, they are building this uh, ICU uh, uh, standard that will allow interoperable devices to communicate. And for example, even with, with something like that, you can have with uh, implantable devices where if the device is not fully clear about the context of the patient, it might actually require information from the user itself. A lot of people don't like to be able to control uh, their pacemakers from mobile phones or something like that. Um, <laughs> medical domain is different than automotive because people are not so open to, to downloading new uh, software over the air as you would maybe, for example, four cent USBs to plug into your, 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 your car and you can download new, new firmware there. How many of us would be open to saying, okay, now download new firmware on my pacemaker? Okay, or let's mess up with information. But something like that should be included. And the way how you can systematically include that to capture information in a, in a, in a, in a formal way is a very, very relevant research question that I'm hoping some of my students will be very interested to pursue. I'm looking at you. <laughs> <laughs> Is there also a systematic way to incorporate uh, adaptive or data-driven, I don't know, improvements to a model? Like if your heart model can only be so descriptive, so if there's some embedded sensors that could improve the model online, anything like that? So adaptive algorithms are awesome, but are very hard to reason about. Okay. And it is the, 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 it's, it's a whole different kind of world that, that that opens up with, with that. Uh, you do, on the other hand, have use of, of adaptive control now in, in, uh, in aviation. And uh, you are seeing the use of things like that in, uh, in, in other models. And the question is, how can you ensure that it won't hurt, uh, that it won't hurt the user or patients in this particular case? And then again, what you can use is there are some kind of simplex architectures that the most important thing is how can you detect the things that are going wrong such that you can switch to suboptimal but safe controller. So for example, if you're trying to, to figure out, so you, you try to figure out context of a patient in that example that we spoke about, and then all of a sudden you're not sure whether the patient is running or if you, you actually don't have enough sensing to figure out what's going on, then maybe you shouldn't be using adaptive pacing at that particular time. So those kind of capturing those kind of, oh, I'm not sure about these things, so I need to not use all the bells and whistles that, that the device provides, is, in my opinion, at least the first step toward designing these systems. So I have a question uh, in terms of the role of memory and processing the system. So your example of a, of a drone landing in Iran, if I'm driving in Boston and 
my GPS suddenly says I'm in Texas, I don't have to listen for and count the number of country music stations. I know that I could not have gotten to Texas by taking that left turn. Uh, so, I mean, how how do you build in memory and and some some context into a system? So, in in, in control theory, you have something. Uh, you have a lot of work on on um, fault detection, and if you're in Boston, you cannot be in uh, in, uh, in in Texas. In, in one minute. But you can actually launch very subtle attacks that over intervals of time okay. will make you think that you are actually going to Texas. And, uh, and those, kind of, uh, those kind of stealth attacks cannot be detected by, by standard, uh, uh, by standard, uh, 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 by standard intrusion detection algorithms. You can push more processing power. If you use compressed sensing like <coughs> algorithms, you are doing some sort of L not optimization or things of that sort, that's MP hard, it takes a lot of power. So then you might be able to, that is one, one area of research that we are pursuing, you are trying to, most of the times, don't use these uh, this computationally costly algorithms, but when you are actually not sure something weird is going on, you actually then switch to this, this uh, computationally heavy uh, uh, algorithm that can then tell you, no, no, this, this cannot be described by, by sensor models of things. Or there are other things of, you can ping, for example, you are seeing that you are moving slowly toward Texas, but all of a sudden you turn left, and if the GPS is still providing, so you have this extra stimuli that you can insert into your system. You ping the system and see if you, determine, if you detect extra disturbance, and then you say, oh yeah, the, the, my sensors are behaving the way they're supposed to be. That's, for example, one thing. But there is, there is the, again, like in all these things, there is no silver bullet, and you have to see another problem, and I'll stop in 10 seconds, <laughs> um, is that you don't want to build a car that costs $5 million. You maybe will be able to, get, people will pay maybe 200 bucks more for extra security features. So then you have to provide this trade-off of, of what can I, what I have for this amount of money, and what kind of guarantees to provide. Well, thank you again.